Welcome to The Leader's Notebook with Dr. Mark Rutland. Dr. Rutland is a world-renowned leadership expert. He is a New York Times best-selling author, and he has served as the president of two universities. The Leader's Notebook is brought to you by Global Servants. For more information about Global Servants, please visit our website, globalservants.org. Here is your host, Dr. Mark Rutland. All right, if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those, Genesis chapter 14. I want to ask you a question as we begin. Let's the Longest time you have ever, I don't mean like an hour, 15 minutes, how many years, weeks, months, years. What is the longest time you have ever prayed for one person, a lost person, somebody you prayed for them to be saved? A week, a month, a year, five years, 10 years. What is the longest you've ever prayed for one lost person to get saved? I want to see a few hands. Somebody raise your hand. What's the longest, how long? 15 years. And did they get saved? Are you still on that 15 years? Still on it? Who else? Come on. Yes, ma'am. 20 years. And did they get saved? Are you still praying? They got prayed. They got saved 20 years. So you got five more years, sister. (laughs) Who else? Anybody else? All right. I want to talk to you as we begin tonight. We're going to deal with, with three things. We're going to deal with Abram as intercessor. We're going to deal with Abram as rescuer. And we're going to deal with Abram as worshiper. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 14. Begin reading at verse 17. I'm kind of at the end of the story, but just have the text before us. And the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram after his return from the slaughter of Kedor Leomer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and Abram, he, Abram, and he, Melchizedek, was the priest of the Most High God. Now, I just want to go through again because sometimes the pronouns in the King James Bible are a little vague. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, And he, Melchizedek, was the priest of the Most High God. And he, Melchizedek, blessed him, Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Manra, let them take their portion. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and for this time tonight. And we pray that you will open our hearts and minds to receive all that you have for us. I believe you for it. I thank you for it in advance. In the wonderful name, Jesus, our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In Jesus' name, amen. On last Wednesday night, if you were here or if you happened to see it um, uh, 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 as we streamed it last Wednesday, wherever you were, let me just remind you, we touched on Lot being captured uh, in and led away in the in the sack of Sodom, so uh, ten kings attack Sodom, and they loot the city and capture the citizens and lead them away as captives. And I just mentioned it in passing, saying it should have been a warning to Lot to get away from Sodom. It wasn't. Even after he was rescued, he went back to Sodom. His Life ends in a mad scramble of wickedness beyond description. 
But I want to deal tonight. Now we're going to go back and deal with his rescue. So the central figure of that story on last week of that particular part was Lot. But tonight it's Abram. When Abram hears that his uh, relative, his nephew, Lot, has been captured, he immediately mobilizes his, his own forces at his own expense. He just ta- he has uh, a few hundred um, herdsmen, cowboys that work for him, and, and he tells them all to mount up, load up, and, and they go after them. Now, when, when we began to think about um, intercession for someone else, we're going to come to prayer and intercession. But sometimes prayer is not enough. Sometimes you got to mount up. Sometimes you have to make the visit. Sometimes you have to make the phone call. Sometimes you have to go and rescue them. Now, what is important, and this is very important, you are not responsible for the outcome. Lot, uh, Abram rescues Lot, but Lot immediately returns to Sodom. And I just want to say to you, sometimes the work of the soul winner is frustrating because all we can do is intercede and act in faith to be the intercessor or the rescuer as much as we can, but we are not responsible for anybody else's ultimate decision before God. The fact that Lot returns to Sodom in no way invalidates what Abram does. So he goes after the this large army with a few hundred of his cowboys. He goes after them and he rescues Lot and his people. Now, as he comes back, there's, there's a confluence of events. I just want to point, it, point out to you, if you will... Look at at verse uh, 21. And the king of Sodom, let's go back first of all. Verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram after his return. So Abram has rescued all the people from Sodom, gotten back all the loot that these 10 kings have, have captured. And as he starts to return, the king of Sodom starts toward him. But look what happens before they can meet. And verse 18, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God. And Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Sometimes there will come that moment... I don't know who this is for tonight, but somebody needs to hear this. There will come that moment where you're about to enter into a situation where you could be exposed to danger or to um, some some situation where you're... Where, Hola, Mario. ¿Cómo le va? Everybody turned to Mario and said, Bienvenidos. <laughs> I already told them. I said, my friend's not here, and I'm so disappointed. Glad you're here. Oh, you're, oh, you're doing counseling. Okay, well, you're excused. <laughs> so sometimes there'll come that moment where without thinking, something could go wrong. Now look at the interaction. The king of Sodom is just coming toward Abram to offer him all this wealth. Take everything, he says. Everything you want. He, it could have made Abram phenomenally wealthy. Think now, all this, everything that has been stolen from Sodom, Abram could have it. And the king is starting toward Abram to say this to him. And Melchizedek steps in and arrives first. It's extremely important. Sometimes right before a situation that it could expose you to temptation or danger or to a wrong decision, God will step in and and you need to pause, wait, take advantage of that delay and hear what God has to say. So the king of Sodom is approaching Abram and he's about to bless him phenomenally with his huge wealth. 
And the king of Salem steps in. And what does he say? Blessing, bless you. So before he could get the quote unquote blessing of Sodom, he gets the blessing of, of Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Now let's deal with the word Salem for just a minute. Salem is an English variation and it is the end of the, of another city that you're familiar with, Jerusalem. So he's the king of Salem. He is the king of peace. So you might say this is a high priest, a king of peace. So he is a, he is a representative of God who steps in between this wrong blessing. Not every blessing is a blessing you can afford to accept. You have to hear this. I wish I could speak to young people. Not everything that comes to you that looks good is good. The king of Sodom is coming. It's already in the king of Sodom's mind to offer all this wealth to give everything to to Abram. And as he's coming near, God interdicts, steps in the middle, and he says, no, I bless you. I will bless you. So that when Abram answers the king of Sodom, of Sodom, he is strengthened in the inner man. Look at his answer. Look how bold it is. He says, I have raised my hand to God. I have sworn before God, you won't give me a shoelace. I don't want anything. I don't ever want anybody to say the king of Sodom made me rich. I don't ever want it to be said. I was... Um, Young evangelist, uh, in my early 30s, I believe it was during Lincoln's second term, if I remember right. And uh, we were, Allison and I were trying to get the ministry going. It was just struggling, limping along. I was preaching night after night after night, trying to, to just get started in preaching in little tiny churches from Dan to Beersheba and traveling and we were just living on the edge of poverty trying to get this evangelistic ministry started. And out of the blue, one night, a lady called our house. And she said, I was recently somewhere in the house where you preached. And she said, I want to offer you a job. She said, I want to offer you a job as the traveling representative for my company. She said, I have company, I have work all over Southeast Asia. All you have to do, she said, you don't have to manage anything. You travel as my public relations representative for my company all over Southeast Asia. She said, you can go to Seoul, Korea. You can go to, to Bangkok, Thailand. You can go to, to Kuala Lumpur, all these places. And she said, any place you're there, then you can preach there. So you can go and preach, but you would go as a representative of my company. And she said, and she offered me a salary, incredible salary. And before I could answer her, it came in my mind, don't do this. Just as simple and clear as anything. She said, would you like to think about it? I said, no, ma'am, I don't want to think about it. (laughs) I said, frankly, thinking about it is the wrong thing for me to do. I said, I know the answer on the phone right now. I, I, I can't accept that. Thank you for the offer, but I can't accept that. And I hung the phone up and I had a tremendous sense of relief. Have have you ever had that where just, just peace came over me? Just a sense of relief. To this day, I don't know who that lady was. I don't know what the situation was. I don't remember the salary she offered. What I do know is God has incredibly and wonderfully blessed our ministry, but I believe that that was an offer that was coming from the wrong direction. And that thought came in my mind as clear as anything. Don't do this. And I believe God steps in just as Melchizedek did. Now, we have the issue of Melchizedek. Who is this guy? People have been arguing about it for thousands of years. Not just Christian preachers, Jewish rabbis. It is not, I just want to say this, it is not 100% clear who Melchizedek is. Is he a prefigurement of Christ? In a sense, he is, isn't he? He serves bread and wine to to Abram. 
That certainly is a prefigurement of communion, isn't it? That he comes out to meet him. He is a king of Salem, of Shalom. He is a king of peace. He comes forward and brings peace. He interdicts. He rescues, as it were, perhaps he rescues. At least he comes at a moment where Abram might have been tempted with the blessing of Sodom. Instead, he believes he receives the blessing of God. He blesses Abram, and then Abram tithes to him. Now, this is very, very important. Tithes with what? He does not tithe to him with the finances that he might have received from Sodom. He tithes to him out of the finances of his own money. So he has mounted this army, pursued his rascally nephew, defeated the ten kings, all at his own expense, and he refuses for the king of Sodom to reimburse him for it. And not only that, now he tithes. I, I, I believe that this speaks to us of, at least in this sense, of our relationship with who God is in our lives. At the, t- at the Old Testament level, God is worthy of our praise. Who is greater? The one who tithes or the one who is tithed to? The one who is tithed to is Melchizedek. So Abraham, Abram, is less than Melchizedek. Now think what that is saying. If Abram, the patriarch of all Judaism, if Melchizedek is greater than he is, who is he? So the book of Hebrews takes it even further. The book of Hebrews says that in in Abram, inside his genetic line, in his DNA, there is also the future high priest Aaron. Remember, in Jewish thinking, every person that will ever come after you is already in you. So your DNA contains the the possibility of all of your descendants. So he so the book of Hebrews says that the the priestly order of Aaron, all the priests, the order of Levi, all of that is in Abram. As he comes before to to tithe to and receive communion and receive the blessing from Melchizedek. So if Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and greater than Aaron who is in him, then he is also a greater priest and he is called a priest. He is also a greater priest than the high priestly order of Aaron. Now, this is huge. Then the book of Hebrews goes further. And the book of Hebrews refers to Jesus as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So if there is an order of priests, Melchizedek, and another order of priests, the tribe of Levi, that descend from Aaron, and Melchizedek's order is greater then Aaron's order, then he says, therefore, the high priestly order of Aaron is abrogated. It's finished. We no longer need a high priest after the order of Aaron because we have a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So now we have a whole new order of high priest, Melchizedek. Now, Again, our question, who is Melchizedek? (laughs) So the the challenge is this. In, In Hebrew thinking throughout the whole Bible, what is important? Think Think about all the things you read. And this guy begat this, and this begat this, and this begat that. What is important about what we know about people? Who was his father? Who was his grandfather? Who was his great grandfather? What's the lineage? Where did he come from? Where was he born? Who, who, what's this? We know nothing about Melchizedek. He simply appears. We don't know where he came from. We don't know where he was born. Furthermore, we know nothing about his death. We don't know what happened to him. He never appears again. This one encounter with Abram. No beginning. No ending. No earthly lineage. 
No earthly death. So we struggle then. In Hebrew thinking, in Jewish thinking, what you don't know about somebody is what's really important. So the Jews reckon the fact that his lineage is not mentioned means that he had no lineage. Therefore, he simply appears as this king priest of peace who serves Abraham communion blesses him, receives the tithe, and then disappears. The book of Hebrews, there are only three places in the whole Bible where Melchizedek is mentioned. This guy, Psalm 110, the whole psalm is about Melchizedek, and then the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews says, now we have a new order of priest. There's no need For another high priest after the order of Aaron, that's finished. Because a greater order has been established. And that order of priests doesn't go forward, father, son, father, son, generation after generation after generation. That order has only two members, Melchizedek and Jesus. So... Is Melchizedek a prefigurement of Christ? Is he, is he someone that God sends to teach us what Jesus is like? To bless us, to serve us communion, to receive the tithe, to be blessed. Is he a, a prefigurement of Christ? Or is he an Old Testament, actual Old Testament appearance of Jesus? I have to tell you, I think in the ultimate sense, it's unresolvable. But the second thing is, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that Jesus now is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, why is that important? Every year on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, while the temple stood... Every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, only the high priest, would go in behind the veil. He was the only person allowed in there, and he was only allowed in there one time. And he would, he would go in behind the veil. He would make, make intercession. He would make, uh, pour out the blood of bulls and goats first for himself, first for himself, and then for the people of Israel. Inside the veil, he had pomegranates sewed around the bottom of his robe. But between the pomegranates, there were little bells that were sewn. What was the purpose of those little bells? What's the purpose of all bells? To ring, right? So imagine a long flowing robe with bells on the bottom as he ministered inside the temple inside the veil, that robe would swing back and forth and those bells would ring. Why? It was to send a testimony to the people on the outside. Your high priest is on the inside interceding for you. So they could hear the bells ring and they would know my high priest is in there praying for my sins to be forgiven. This is the day of atonement. He's in there moving around the altar and there's the testimony. They would listen to hear those bells ring. If the bells ever stopped ringing, it was against, there was no furniture in there for that priest to sit down. If the bells stopped ringing, it meant the priest had died. And they had had to reach through with a hook and drag him out. So Paul says, or whoever the writer of the book of Hebrews is, if we're going to argue over who Melchizedek is, why don't we have a whole debate over who wrote the book of Hebrews? We could be here all night. But whoever wrote the book of Hebrews says that we now have a new order. Those priests were all of the order of Aaron. Now we have an order, after a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. It didn't begin. It doesn't end. It's not going away. What's one of the problems with an earthly priest? It's like an earthly pastor. You get a pastor you love. You say, oh, we like this guy. He's so charming and friendly and great and a good speaker. And then as soon as you get used to him, what? 
He dies or the church of God moves him or something. And now all of a sudden, y'all, you say, I don't like this guy. This guy doesn't, you know, that's so we now have a high priest who's never going away. The bells never stop ringing. He's not going to die. He's not going to get old. He's not going to get senile. And he has no purpose inside behind the veil except what? To intercede for us. You now have a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, without beginning, without end, perfect, without blemish. He doesn't have to sacrifice anything for himself because he has no sin. His only purpose inside the veil is to intercede for you. So tonight, right now, this moment, right now, and eternally, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus of Nazareth, is inside the veil. He is moving inside the veil, and he is praying, interceding for us to let us know our sins are forgiven. What is the sound of the bells? It's the Holy Ghost. The witness of the intercession. That is what is called witnesses with the blood. The witness that comes out to us is your sins are forgiven. You have an high priest who is at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, interceding for you. Without beginning, without end, constantly interceding for you. That is why When we serve Holy Communion in church, when we celebrate Holy Communion, it is a reminder that our high priest after the order of Melchizedek invites us to sit down with him and enjoy the blessing. And that when we leave, he says, as he said to Abraham, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you. We have a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is a a mystery moment. Uh, this man, Melchizedek, appearing in the desert to Abram. It's a mysterious moment. And it's one of those wonderful moments in the Old Testament that speaks to us majestically of something in the New Testament. Whether that is actually an appearance of Christ, I'm just not running for Congress on that. Whether that is actually an appearance of Christ or whether it is a prefigurement of Christ, what is the difference. The real issue is not the appearance of Melchizedek in Genesis. The real issue is the appearance of our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who is Christ, our intercessor. Now think what he says. I go now to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. The high priest after the order of Aaron could never have said that to the Jewish people. I'm going inside the veil and I'm going to prepare a place for you inside there in the spiritual domain, in the heavenly place, in the holy of holies. And once I get it prepared, I'm going to come back out here through the veil and get you and take you in and you can sit down with me in the presence of God. He could never have said that. But listen to what Jesus says. I go now to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, will I not come again that where I am, you may be also? That we are adopted into the brethren that where he is, we may sit together with him in the heavenly domain, inside the veil. Now, here's the remarkable thing. When Christ died on Calvary, the veil in the temple split from the top down. From the top down. You know this. Why from the top down? Because no man could reach it and tear it. It had to be torn by the hand of God. So as Jesus is breathing his last breath on Calvary, the hands of God Almighty take hold of the veil in the temple and it begins to shake. It causes an earthquake. It's shaking, shaking. And Jesus says, it is finished. What? The separation between God and man is finished. It's finished. And God rips the veil open from the top down, saying, signifying unto us, come therefore, what? Boldly before the throne. Now, you all know that. Now, have you thought about this? The temple stood 
And the, 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 the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the temple stood and the day of atonement was celebrated for 70 more years before the temple was destroyed. What does it mean? It means that God tore away the veil and religion put it back. Religion said we would, we want to be separated. We'd rather have tradition. We'd rather have religious observance. We'd rather shiver on the outside. We'd rather wait. We'd rather hear Bill bells ring than the witness of the Holy Ghost. We'd rather have the priesthood of Aaron than the priesthood of Melchizedek. That's the reason the writer of the book of Hebrews, the whole book of Hebrews is based on one word, one English word, better, better. Sometime read the book of Hebrews, not during my message, on your own time. Sometime take the book of Hebrews and take a pen or a pencil and circle every superlative in the book of Hebrews. Every time, better, holier, higher, more perfect, every superlative, everything that is of better. Circle it and then look at the book of Hebrews. Jesus is a better sacrifice. He's a better temple. He's a better priest. He's better than the angels. He's better than Aaron. He's better than Abraham. The whole book is based on that. So the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, look, the veil is torn away. The priesthood of Aaron is finished. No more. We don't have the blood of bulls and goats and heifers and all that. We don't have all that. Now we have an eternal sacrifice, even the blood of Jesus. We have an eternal priest. He'll never get old. He'll never die. The veil is gone. The priesthood of Aaron is gone. And now we have a new order of the priesthood of Melchizedek which is now ours eternally, and we have through him immediate, personal access to God the Father Almighty. Come, therefore, boldly before the throne where you find grace in time of need. And all of that whole thing is based on this mysterious appearance of this guy, Melchizedek, alone in the desert. Abraham himself is blessed. Abraham is strengthened. Abraham is shielded from the false blessing of Sodom. But in Abraham, all the nations of all the people forever and ever are blessed by the appearance of Melchizedek. Now, let's deal with one other thing. And that's the issue of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I just want to deal with it. This all happens. Abraham goes back his way. Lot, this nincompoop, he goes back to Sodom. He ignores the warning. God has warned him. It's a clear warning. Sodom is in the way of destruction. He goes back, goes back to it all. And then Abraham, and then uh, the Lord appears to Abraham in the plains of Mamre, and he says, I'm going down and destroy Sodom. The, he sends the angel of the Lord, the angel of destruction. He says, I'm going to uh, go down. The, the, the filth of Sodom and Gomorrah has reached the Lord's ears. And the Lord has sent me. I'm going to destroy the whole city. Now, why would he reveal that to Abraham? Why would he do that? This is fascinating. Abraham begins to negotiate with God. It's It's fascinating. I have a wonderful friend, my friend of 30 years, who's a, a, a guide. He's, he's not a Christian. He's not a believer. He's a Jewish guide in Israel. And he says it's the most Jewish passage in the whole Bible. He said God tells him what he's going to do, and Abraham starts negotiating. And he says, would you, would you destroy the city if there were 50 righteous men? No, I wouldn't. Not for 50. What about for 40? No, not for 40. Abraham presses it. What about for 30? No, I want not for 30. Finally, he gets him down. Finally, Abraham says, let me just, let me just ask you one, one last time. What if you can find 10? What if you can find 10 righteous people? Will you still, would you save Sodom and Gomorrah for 10 righteous people? Let me just give you a couple of things that it means. First of all is this. The secularists, the humanists, the liberals, the anti-Christian, anti-faith, Christian and Jew haters in this country, whether they realize it or not, they should be so grateful for the presence of the church inside the culture. 
God often spares a country and a culture even that is massively wicked because he doesn't want to bring destruction upon the minority that brings that brings his grace and his protection. This country, the United States of America, may actually, we may be the Christians in this country, the believers in this country, may actually be the little Dutch boy standing with his finger in the dike holding back the piled up horror of God's judgment that could fall on this country, by all rights, ought to fall on this country. Ought to fall on this country. And God may be holding it back for the sake of the very people that the predominant culture despises. Isn't that a, isn't that a, a phenomenal paradox? The people that hate us may actually be being protected from the wrath of God because of us. So God says, even for 10, even for 10, I won't destroy him. The second thing about it is this. When we're doing, I said, sometimes when we have someone lost, you have to mount up and go get them. Sometimes you can't. And you have to know the difference. Abraham does not go to Lot, don't go to Sodom the second time and get Lot. God tells him what he's going to do. All he does that time is intercede. Sometimes your brother-in-law is lost as a ball in high weeds. And sometimes God will say, get up and go get him. Go find him. Go witness to him. Go, go, go rescue him. And you need to mount up at your own expense. And the outcome is not yours. Remember, if Lot goes back to Sodom, that's not your business. You did what you were told. Other times God reveals something to you and all you're to do is intercede. But this habit that American Christians have fallen into of making these little spot prayers and let it go is flies in the face of the call to continue intercession. Abraham stays after it. What about for 100? What about for 50? What about for 30? What about for 10? He stays after it. Sometimes... Sometimes you get a word from God the first moment you pray for something. Fine. But there is this thing that the modern church has to a large extent lost, and that is to catch hold of the horns of the altar and pray and say, God, I will not let you go until the blessing I receive. To pray through. We've kind of lost the whole thing of praying it through to intercede right to the end. Just catch hold of God and say, now, God, we're going to negotiate on this thing. I'm going to stay with you on it. Sometimes to go, sometimes to pray. You have to know the difference, whether to mount up and go rescue Lot or whether to intercede. But if it's to intercede, then to hang on to God and pray it through. Then finally, we see this one last thing from Abraham. This, this little story is such a tiny little story, and it's so filled with insight. Here is this one. We see Abraham as intercessor. We see him as rescuer. We see him as worshiper with, with Melchizedek. But there is a continued motif in this whole story that's easily missed. And it is Abraham as releaser. He doesn't clutch at anything. He releases everything. He releases all the wealth. I just don't want you to underestimate what the king of Sodom is offering him. Ten armies have destroyed Sodom and taken everything in the city. Think what that mountain of loot is. And the king of Sodom offers it to Abraham and he says, I don't want to touch him. I don't want a shoelace. He releases Then he releases the tithe. He lets go of the tithe. Then he releases Lot. There is a tendency in all of us to clutch things, people, to our breast and scream, mine, mine, mine. It may feel like intercession, but sometimes it's not really intercession. It's clutching. The person, the child, the lost loved one, the re- the rebel, sometimes the greatest intercession is to let go of them. Open your hands. 
Pray, keep on praying, but release. I give them to you. I give them to you. Now I'll close with this. This whole story really is why I believe in giving. Giving is a means of release. We've already had the offering, so I'm not trying to jack the offering up. I'm just trying to tell you something. I I believe that tithing is an obligation. Tithing is a rule to 10%. I believe in that. But I believe that so often it becomes obligatory. We just tithe because it's the rule. We're supposed to tithe. We learned it when we got to Sunday school. What I think God wants is that spirit of release, the joy of giving, the release. I don't think for one, do you think for one moment that when Abraham met Melchizedek in the desert and he brought out bread and wine and served him communion there, and it says, and Abraham tithed to him. Do you think for one moment that Abraham brought out his abacus and said, well, I've got 375 camels and 285 sheep, and let me, that would be this amount, and that would be this times point one. No, it's, it's not mathematical. It's release. That's what I see in Abraham. He is a man who knows how to release and let go. Sometimes to rescue, sometimes to intercede, sometimes to hang on to God, sometimes to let go of God and let go of everything, to release and let God have his way. It's a powerful little passage, isn't it? Let me close. We were at a worship service at Calvary Church where I was the pastor, and I preached on interceding for your lost loved ones. And Chip Kelly is a member of our church, massive auditorium, 5,000 seats. And I said, right now, think of the person you've prayed for the most often. I'll never forget this night as long as I live. The person you've prayed for the most often, the longest, the hardest, with the greatest passion. Think of them. And right now, pray the prayer of release. Say, God, I give them to you. Chip Kelly stood up and he said, oh, my God, Pastor, I just got a text. The guy that I released just got saved. I'll never forget that. Sometimes let them go. Well, let's pray and then Pastor will come and give us some direction. Lord, we thank you so much for the goodness, the glory, the grandeur. Lord, the mystery of Melchizedek. We, we, We will not blaspheme by saying we understand it all. We just want to get in on it all. We thank you for our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, even this same Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. You've been listening to The Leader's Notebook with Dr. Mark Rutland. You can follow Dr. Rutland on X at Dr. Mark Rutland or visit his website, drmarkrutland.com, where you can find information about his materials and his app. Join us next week for another episode of The Leader's Notebook.